All right. It's a couple of things off the top. So um, got the exam written. Uh, usually I do 20 questions. We've got like a little over an hour. So kind of two hours for the final. So instead of doing like 40, only have 30 questions on there. Okay. So time shouldn't be an issue. Um, about half of it's going to be kind of linear regression, which is stuff we kind of went over last week. I tried to do even some review a little bit or just more examples on Wednesday. The other half is going to be kind of comparing two populations. We'll do a lot of re review on that today. Uh, both the practice exams give kind of a good idea about what the exams will look like. Kind of similar to the past ones, like they'll start kind of chrono they'll kind of go through chronologically how we cover things in class. Um, okay, so I'll bring standard normal student T tables for you. I'll also bring the formula sheet so you don't have to worry about printing those off and bringing them in. Um, a reminder of when, so we look at the syllabus. I think I might have mentioned it might be earlier at one point, but kind of given um, everyone's schedules, our time slot is going to be Wednesday from 4.30 to 6.30, okay? So this has been in the syllabus all year. I was a little, thought maybe we could switch it around a little bit. Um, oh, we have kind of a weird class time. So like there's a sign slots for three o'clock and five o'clock Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes. Well, we're a Monday, Wednesday at four. Um, but if you had a class, if you have this class, you couldn't have the Monday, Wednesday, Friday at five. So I believe that's our kind of our assigned time slot. We'll wait till these people pass by. So that's going to be kind of our, our assigned time. So we'll meet in here. Um, and I think that's all I kind of have about the final. Are there any questions about kind of logistic questions about the, the final? I'll obviously dive into the material a little bit here today. Yeah. Is it all multiple choice? Yep. So I'll kind of keep it all multiple choice. I've done kind of different combinations. And I think, uh, especially on the linear regression stuff, sometimes I'll do some short answer. I think the multiple choice actually really will help you out um, because it's easy to maybe be really lost and not be able to even get any work down for some of those interpretations. And the multiple choice kind of gives you a direction to head into. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like on the last two tests, the formula sheet was kind of like base, like in the way that we're having things will be somewhat similar to the federal. Yep. So the, it's currently up there on that final exams uh, material. So two populations, when we knew the population variances, confidence intervals, test statistic. Comparing two proportions, confidence interval, test statistic. Comparing two sample means when we only had sample variances, confidence interval, test statistic. Matched pairs or that average difference, confidence interval, test statistic, right? Um, and then this is kind of, you know, a lot of this isn't going to be stuff we're going to use. I'm never making you calculate this, right? R squared, I'm just going to have you be interpreting, you know, the, the value Excel spitting out at you. So you don't really have to worry about these formulas. This just kind of reminds us that to make predictions for Y, we'll take the estimates we find from our Excel output, plug in the hypothetical person's X values. Maybe we'll get a little bit of example of this today uh, before we get to the end of class. Test statistic, just take that coefficient, divide it by the standard error. We said last Wednesday, this should be one of the easiest questions on the exam. We never have to do any of this behind the scenes. Excel is going to do that for us, right? There's really not a lot of equations when it comes to linear regression because the actual equations are all done through Excel. Any other kind of just, yeah. Um, what do you think would be the best way to study for you? The best way, probably start out, go through the practice exams, mm -hmm. figure out which ones you're not really sure how to answer, right? Or kind of once you go through it, figure out which ones you got wrong, which ones you weren't really sure where to start, then look at the answer key. And then if you can't figure out from the answer key why the correct answer is what it is, either reach out to me, I'll be available most of the day tomorrow, if you want to kind of schedule time to meet up. Um, Wednesday afternoon for the exam, I might not be around in the afternoon a little bit in between some of my this exam and another one, um, or just reach out via email if you're not sure on those. After you go through those practice exams, go through the answer keys, try to make sure you can reproduce all those. If you want to keep going, uh, the next thing I would say is uh, I'll get up this afternoon. Sorry, this afternoon. When I get back to my office, um, I've got the answer key for the fifth Excel. I'll kind of pop that up there. That would just be some more good review of, of Excel, depending on how well you did or if you even attempted that fifth Excel. It'd be a good one to kind of go through. The Excel part, running the regressions, you won't have to worry about, but the other questions would be something that you might be expected to answer, right? Um, and then on top of that, if you really want to keep going, that would go back through like the slides and kind of look at those, I, I mean, where we see like an eye clicker question.
Any other questions? Logistics. Okay. Once again, before we jump into things, like a little bit more I want to say. So we kind of get it all out of the way so we can just start doing a review. So if you look at Canvas, I, I just got this updated this afternoon. Uh, this is why the answer key isn't up, quite up yet. But I did get that fifth Excel assignment graded and that connect kind of assignment is now factored in. Now, you'll notice those categories are counting for 0% of your overall grade because I went in and dropped your lowest and that grade is reflected here. And those are the ones that are kind of being, you know, are being weighted now into your grade. Okay. So if you had some zeros in there before, right, now they, you know, your lowest should be dropped. So if you take a look at your grades, they might be a little bit, bit higher than they were before. Okay. Or updated at least. Any other questions where you kind of jump in? So I showed you guys that figure out your grade tool Wednesday, right? Yes, no? Yes, okay. So you should have everything you kind of need now. You've got your Excel Connect grade with the lowest drop. You've got your iClear grade with the lowest drops, okay? Yeah. Uh, you mean like you can type in like the grade for your final? Yeah, so it's up under the files tab. I'll open it up here. Just looks something like this. Basically, all it's doing is finding a weighted average for you. You just plug in your kind of grades here, right? Your Excel with the lowest drop, Connect with the lowest dropped, iClicker with the three lowest dropped, your two exam scores, and then you can play around like this person. If you're acing things, I think I was using an example. Like you get a 65 and still get an A, right? You could probably get like a 40 and still get an A minus. Yeah, right? you do really poor if you have set yourself up well, right? Any questions on, on that? Okay. <clears throat> so let's go with, yeah. And for the task, we need the Z tables and the T tables, right? Yep. And like I said, I'll print those out and bring them. So you, you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, you will you will need those. Right? So I think this one's primarily, yeah, a lot of regression in this one. So let's look at practice exam A. This will be some of the older stuff. So one thing we're looking at these comparing two population examples, some things that kind of keep, keep uh, track of is sometimes we use the standard normal, sometimes we use that student P, right? So it gets a little bit easier, I guess. And actually easier, but there's really only one scenario. Um, sorry, there's two scenarios where we'll use the standard normal. The other scenarios we'll use the standard or the student T. So if we're comparing two means and we know the population variances, or we're comparing two groups sample proportions. So anytime you see proportions, we should be thinking that standard normal, or we use our Z tables to look up things like critical values, PWs. If we're comparing two means and all we have are sample variances, or we're looking at those mean differences, all we have is a sample variance there, and we don't really look PWs and critical values up, but remember, uh, if we're looking at kind of slope coefficients and we have the standard error, all of these are actually going to use, I guess I should have, right? I'll be complete. <laughs> the student T distributions, right? So, what P values are about. so this is a good way to kind of keep track of things. If you ever know the population variance or you're looking at the difference in proportions, standard norm. Anytime you see these sample variances, we're using that student T. So this one, I think, asks, you know, which of the following would you use the standard normal? So here, two population means when the population variances are unknown. Well, that's when we only have sample variances. So that's student T. We're looking at sample coefficients. We said that's student T. Competent hypothesis for matched pairs. Matched pairs, we only ever have a sample variance on that difference variable. And then whenever we're looking at two population proportions, proportions are always using that standard normal for the Z tables. Okay. Questions on that one? Well, should be kind of straightforward. It's a good thing to kind of have as you're kind of studying to kind of keep keep track of everything. So let's look at this first one. So we've got kind of BMI measures between two different states, Indiana and Ohio. We've got some sample variances calculated from that data. And we have 40 individuals from one state, 50 from the other. We want to build a 95% confidence interval for the true difference between Indiana and Ohio's BMI. Now here I kind of set this up, take group one minus group two. Group one here, we've got indicated as being Indiana, right? And group two is being Ohio. Okay. So 
hopefully right away, like even if we can't quite remember the confidence interval equation, we know that we're going to build it around whatever sample difference we find. Right? So my sample mean from group one was 28, second one 29. So I know that my confidence interval, which confidence inter interval should be centered around negative one. My right? negative one should be smack dab in the middle of this confidence interval. Now, if I'm looking at this one, negative one is going to be a little bit closer to negative 1.7 than it would be a 0 0.026. So it's a little bit harder to see with these numbers, but if it's not exactly in the middle, I can rule that answer out. The note C can't be the right answer. Negative one, a lot closer to negative 1.48 than it is to positive. So I could rule out B. Uh, the other ones, it looks like it's, it's right in the middle. So there, I actually could kind of do some work. But I can rule out some of those answers where that sample difference in the means is not exactly in the middle. So from there, I'm probably not gonna be able to do this from memory. So I'm gonna pull open or look at my formula sheet. Now I've got sample means where I only have sample variances, right? So here's my confidence interval equation. Here's my pacifist equation. So we've got a confidence interval. Now we can plug in. So we're gonna look at, I could even just write this down to have like in front of me, and then just plug in my values, right? So I can't remember them off the top of my head. So we're going to go to look here again. So we've got what? A variance of nine. And was it 40 people from? Yeah, 40 people from Indiana. And then a variance of 16 from the 50 people from Ohio. But at this point, I'm just plugging in the values I was given, right? And I'll kind of have a similar setup as on the exam as I do in this one. So the only thing left I have to do is find this T value, the number of standard deviations the way I need to go. Well, I need to know what level of confidence I'm building for. So that's 95%. So my alpha should be what? We don't know this. I'm scared. At the 95% confidence. Yeah, 0 0.05, right? So what we're thinking about doing, and our equation reminded us, oh, yeah, we're using that student T distribution. I need to find the T value such that if I go kind of that many standard deviations to the left and the right, I'll have half of alpha in each tail. Right? So here, if my alpha is 0 0.05, I actually want 0 0.025 in each tail. Right? And the form of the sheet does kind of, uh, where well, there it is, reminds me of that. Okay. Now, a question like this, I said I'm not going to make you calculate it, and I would have to give you an assumed true degrees of freedom which is what I did here, right? Assume the degrees of freedom is equal to 50, okay? So I go to my student T table. I want 0 0.025 in each tail. I scroll down to my degrees of freedom of 50, 2.009. Now it's just a matter of getting this entered into my calculator, okay? <clears throat> Any questions on it? On that, or the setup on that one. Um, the answer key's up there. I'm not sure the, the number off the top of my head without kind of breaking this down. Um, I think if I'm looking at this right, my guess is it's going to be, mm, it's probably pretty small. I would think deep. I'm not 100% sure. You'd have to actually enter this into our calculator to kind of get to that lower number bound. Right. Questions there? Okay, so what if on three, I wanted to instead of doing a confidence and we'll do some hypothesis testing, right? So I wanna figure out what's the test statistic for this, right? So I'll show you where it's at in the form of the sheet, but hopefully the, the setup is kind of similar for a lot of these. When we're looking at two populations, our numerator is always gonna be this sample difference that we found. And we said, usually you would then subtract the assumed true difference but all of these examples I told you, I'm always going to use this assumed true difference of zero. Right? So we can kind of ignore that, right? Subtracting zero doesn't change anything. We then always divide by the standard deviation of the statistic we're looking at. Well, in fact, with a confidence interval, this is how many standard deviations away we want to go. We then multiply that by the standard deviation of that statistic. So we kind of already have that. 
from our conference and I'll show you once again, like I said, where it's at from the uh, test is test statistics at the form, you don't have to remember this from you know going and memorizing it. But this equation that we use in the conference interval will also be the kind of standard deviation equation we use in that net denominator for our test statistics. So here on the test statistic, it's really about just identifying the correct formula. And here it's just plugging things in, right? So I've got 28 minus 29 divided by the square root of 9 over 40 plus 16 over 50. So right away, if I look at this and I remember that for every single test statistic equation, my denominator represents some type of standard deviation. My denominator is always going to be positive. So whatever sample difference I find for these two population examples will always tell me the sign of my test statistics. So here, I know I'm going to have a negative test statistic. Right, because I know the denominator is positive. So if I look here, it looks like I can rule out B and C right away. Okay. So where's this at in the formula sheet if we couldn't remember it from memory? Right here below that confidence interval equation. Notice I don't even put the assumed true difference in there because I'm always going to give you zero. Any questions on that? All right, so let's think about this. If I've got this hypothesis test, what type of tail test do I have? So how do I identify the type of test? I always look at the alternative hypothesis. What sign do I have in my alternative hypothesis? Less than, so I'm going to have a less than or a left tail test. So remember, you gotta think about that less than sign. You think about this as left tail, greater than to greater than a right tail test, not equal to is our two tail test. So we end up with a test statistic, right? Once we plug all these values into our calculator, I think it's negative 1.35, but I could be remembering that incorrectly. Anyone wants to check in the house, check in from letting me know. Um, but in the next one, so you don't have cascading errors, I'm going to give you an assumed true value for that test statistic. Right? So, so we've got this left tail test. And I'm thinking about, okay, let's assume that that test statistic I found was negative 1.55. So this is the kind of thing we'll be able to up on the exam so you don't make cascading errors. Right? So now I want you to find for me the critical values as well as the kind of rejection decision. Right? So this was my test statistic. To make my rejection decision using that critical value approach, I then compare that to my critical value. Right? I'll plot my critical value, draw the rejection region. If my test statistics in that rejection region, I can reject. If it's not, I fail to reject. Now right away for a left tail test, I know my critical values have to be what? I'm on the left side, hand side of this distribution, whether or not it's the Z or the T distribution, they're both centered at zero. So the left side, my critical value should be negative. If it's a right tail test, they should be positive. Two tail tests, we said, I'll have two critical values, same value of one positive, one negative. So here, I need to look up the critical value that gives me what alpha in the tail, when we come to the 95% level, it's an alpha of 0 0.05, right? And it's a one tail test. So all of alpha is in that tail. So I go to my student T uh, table. We had that earlier assumed true, whoops, degrees of freedom of 50, right? We now want 0 0.05 in that tail. So we go down 1.676, right? Now, the student T distribution table always looks at the right side. It's kind of a problem for us because we had a left tail test. But it doesn't really matter because if the area to the right of positive 1.676 is 0 0.05, the area to the left of negative 1.676 should also be that alpha of 0.05, right? It's a symmetric distribution. Right? So when it comes to the, using the student T distribution, if we have a left tail test, we're going to find the value from our student distribution, but it's going to be 
we need to make it negative, right? It's a left tail test. It's that value but negative. Questions on that? So left tail tests, I find that critical value, that threshold number of standard deviations. I draw a tail or an arrow with my left tail if I want the nice visual. Now I can see that my test statistic, if I plotted these against it, it's not quite in that rejection, right? It's a little bit smaller than my critical value. So if I'm not in the rejection region here, we would say at that 5% significance level, I failed to reject. If I instead gave you, you know, an assumed true test statistic of, I don't know, negative 2.3, well, there we are in the rejection region. So we could reject the null at the 5% significance level. Okay, so I think the next one I'm gonna do is so we had what there negative 1.67 and we would just barely not reject the null, right? We were just outside of it. Um what examples whatever, yeah, we'll do this one. So let's instead assume I've got one of these proportion examples. This is a little bit trickier, but I'm comparing the proportion. I usually do gun ownership. Is that what I did here? Yeah, gun ownership in Canada versus the US. This data is easy to get. So I've got two samples. Here is nice. I had the same sample size from both, both countries. Found that 32% of, of India or, uh, US citizens have owned guns or uh, households only gun. And then 26% for Canada. So I want to build a 90% confidence interval where that true difference is between US and Canadian gun ownership. Uh, group one being, um, oh, yeah, group one being the US, and then group two kind of being Canadian or Canada. So once again, even if I can't remember the exact equation, hopefully I remember that for this confidence interval, I'm centering it around whatever this sample difference I found was, right? So here I've got what, 0.32 minus 0.26, so positive 0 0.06. So 0 0.06 should be smack dab in the middle of my confidence interval. I can rule these out right away, right? 0 0.06 isn't in this range, right? These are all negative bounds. So I know that has to either be A or B. Now, from here, I have to kind of do the work. So I'll remind myself of the entire equation by looking at my formula sheet. Here's comparing two proportions, confidence intervals. So I'll just write that down so I have that in front of me. And then from there, for all these confidence intervals and test statistics, we're really just plugging in the values we were given. But then for confidence intervals, we have to look up that Z value, the number of standard deviations away we want to go. Okay. So go back here, just start plugging in what we know. We already did this part, right? So 0 0.06, 0 0.32 times 1 minus 0.32 over 250 plus 0.26 times 1 minus 0.26 over 250. Now it might help to kind of do this separately so you can just get one value to plug in there, right? As opposed to like trying to do this all in one line in your calculator. It's kind of personal preference, but I think breaking it down into parts can kind of make it easier. If you do that, keep everything out to at least the fourth decimal, right? So if you're breaking these down like into parts, make sure you're keeping things out to at least the fourth decimal. So the last thing we need to do is look up that Z value, okay? So there's two ways we can do this, right? One, we can think about it as, okay, I need to find this Z value that gives me a total of alpha in the tails or alpha over two in each tail, what level of confidence do we have here? 90%, so my alpha will be 0.1, divide that by two, the area I want in each tail is 0 0.05. Okay. That'll tell me how many standard deviations away I need to go to get 0 0.05 in each tail there. For a total of 0 0.1 outside of my confidence or, or the entire alpha would be outside my interval. So let me see here. We could go to the Z table. We could say, okay, I want 0 0.05 in my tail. So I that's the probability I want. I'm in between these two values. 
negative 1.64 and negative 1.65, right? I use the higher of the two. I've already got kind of that positive negative built in to my confidence interval equation, right? Add that margin area to my upper bound, subtract that margin area to get my lower, lower bound. Now, the other way I could have done it, if I'm okay with this, is we said kind of a nice, easy way, instead of like hunting for the value in here, if I go to my T tables, find the area I want in each tail of 0 0.05, and then scroll all the way down to that very last row, that last row tells me the standard normal values or kind of my comparison values, right? So that one, I can be even a little bit more precise, keeping it out to the third decimal. Right? Now, when it comes to like, if you use the Z table and you've got the second, I'll never give you two sets of answers where like the rounding will like, it, it, it might be off of like the third decimal, but it'll be clear what that correct answer is. I'll never give you two that are only off by like 0 0.001 or something like that. Any questions on this? It's, it's been a while. Hopefully it's kind of refreshing your memory a little bit. So the next thing that we're going to do <laughs> is look at kind of hypothesis testing for these. Okay. So one thing I don't have as much on these practice exams that I do want to kind of go through here for a second is how do I, I'm giving you like assume true hypothesis test here. If I think about this hypothesis test where I've got, is that difference greater than zero in my alternative hypothesis? I've got what type of tail test? Got a, so if there's a greater than sign, I've got a right tail test. So my critical values, if I do look those up, automatically I know it have to be what? The positive, right? I'm on the right hand side of that distribution. So what is this really saying? So let's think about what I've assumed to be true in my null. And then I've got, what do I want to test for? So saying is this difference greater than zero, what I'm really saying is if the U.S. proportion minus the Canadian proportion greater than zero, or the way this would typically be phrased if I asked you to identify the null alternative hypothesis is what you want to test for is does the U.S. have a greater proportion of gun ownership in Canada, right? So that would be kind of how you would be given this, right? If I asked you to identify the null alternative, I would say, okay, look, you want to test for whether or not the U.S. has a greater kind of proportion of gun ownership in Canada. So really what you're saying is you want to test for whether or not that difference is positive, right? Greater than zero. And then when we write that out in terms of the alternative hypothesis, that's what we want to test for. Well, the difference in the proportions we just write as, well, what is the true difference, right? I can observe the sample or the difference in the sample portion, but what's that true difference? So if I started out saying something like, does the U.S. have greater gun ownership than Canada? You would know that you're looking for a difference there that would be positive, right? That's your alternative hypothesis. The null is the exact opposite. Let's see if we can go back. We'll come back to this. But we'll go to our other example. So when we were looking at BMIs and we had kind of this difference being less than zero, what was that really saying? Remember, group one here was Indiana, group two was Ohio. So if we were thinking about this, how might the question be phrased? Like, let's say I want you to identify what the normal alternative are. What would kind of the thing that you're testing for be here, or how would you say it? BMI of Indiana is less than the BMI of Indiana. Yeah, right. If I want to know is this difference negative, what I'm really trying to test for is I want to test for whether or not Indiana has lower BMI values in Ohio. And that would make this my alternative hypothesis. We assume the exact opposite is true then for our null. Yeah. So maybe going back in the slides to look at some of those ones where we just identify the null alternative might be helpful. Um, because I guess I know there's not as many on these, these practice exams for that. So we'll go back down. Um, we want to find the test statistic, right, for this right tail test. So we go to our formula sheet. Here's our test statistic equation. This is the one that was kind of a pain because we break it down into two steps. First, finding P bar. Then we can plug P bar in here. 
and then finding our pacifism. So these pacifism is one of the main, we go through and write this out, uh, but you know, it really just becomes more practice being sure you can kind of get these under your calculator correctly. So you first go through 0.32 times 250 plus 0.26 times 250. This one would be easy. I have to, you know, I wouldn't mix up the sample sizes. And then divide that by a total of 250 plus 250. Anytime we have equal sample sizes, right? You're just finding kind of that, that middle value there. Right? So I believe P bar here would be 0.29. You then have P bar, you plug it in 0.29 times 1 minus 0.29. Plug in your two sample sizes of 250, and then those two proportions that you had, which were 0.32 and 0.26. So once we get everything plugged in there, our test statistic would look something like this, right? So P bar times one minus P bar, and then times one over the sample size for both groups. Okay. So what's the sign of my test statistic definitely going to be here? Every single test statistic equation, yeah, the denominator represents a standard deviation. So my denominators always positive. So here the numerator tells me the sign. Well, my numerator is just the difference in these sample portions, which I found was positive. So I know my test is going to be positive, right? I'm always comparing to this difference of zero. So if I find a positive, I'm going to be a certain number of standard deviations above that value. If I find a negative difference, I'm going to be a certain number of standard deviations below that value, right? So my test statistic has to be positive based off that. So I could rule out B right away. From there, I think it's probably D if you get this entered in your calculator. Um, only because 1.96 looks suspiciously like one of the critical values that we usually find. So my guess is that's not going to be the right answer. And 36 just seems astronomically large, right? Because I found a difference of 0 0.06. How in the world is that 36 standard deviations away? That's a really high test. Maybe if I had a couple tens of thousands of observations here, but we only had 250. Questions on, on this before we keep moving? So what if, instead of looking at critical values, using the critical value approach, here, I want to find the key value. So I give you an assumed true test statistic here. Now, when it comes to the exam, I think on these practice exams, the assumed true values are pretty close to what the actual values are. That may be completely the opposite on the exam. Like sometimes I choose them to be opposite of what they actually are for very specific reasons. So just because you're saying that they're close here on the practice exam, do not assume that on, on the exam. Like I'm picking these numbers for reasons that have nothing to do with what the actual correct number is. So assume that instead of 1.47, we found the test statistic was 1.67. Okay. So I've got this right tail test. I'm dealing with a standard normal distribution. And I found, you know, I just said it, 1.67. My p-value for a right tail test will be the area to the right. Okay. So I'm going to go look this up in my standard normal table or my z tables. I know the z value, so that's 1.67. So I'm going to scroll down here, 1.67. So 0.9525. But remember, and this is where drawing up the visuals can sometimes help you making an easy mistake. Well, that's the area to the left. The, the Z tables always give me the area to the left. I wanted the area to the right. So what do I need to do? Yeah, it's just one minus that. All right, so 0 0.0475 would be my p-value. And then if I'm thinking about at an alpha of 0 0.05, can I reject the null there? Well, using the p-value approach, what's our rejection decision? We use this also for linear regression, so hopefully we remember this going in. If my p-value is less than alpha, I can reject that null. Right? So here, just barely, but yes, I can reject the null. Right? Questions on, on this one? Okay. Um, I'm gonna do, I know we got match pairs for the next one. So I will, I'll show you here, um, it's not on the practice exams, but what if we wanted to find the critical values? And let's just use the same alpha of 0 0.05, just for the sake of this example. 
So if I want the critical value that gives me 0 0.05 in this upper right tail, right? There's kind of two ways I can do it. Now, the problem is if, I, if I'm going to use the standard normal tables and I want to find the value that gives me alpha of 0 0.05 in my right tail, well, these values are actually the area in the, to the left, right? So I can't look up 0 0.05. I would actually have to look up 0.95, right? Because I need to look up the area to the left. This critical value is giving me that desired alpha of 0 0.05 to the right. So I could look up 0.95. Looks like I'm in between these two. 1.64 and 1.65. So just barely, I'm in that rejection region. Same kind of decision is made whether I use the critical value or the p-value approach. Right. Now, another way I could have done this is just said, well, look, I'm going to look up alpha of 0 0.05 negative 1.64, negative 1.65. And then just remember, oh yeah, that's going to be the same value, but I've got a right tail test. So it's going to be positive, right? Positive 1.65 is my critical value. Okay. Or third way, if you like this way better, if I want 0 0.05 in that upper right tail, that last row of my student teeth table is going to be those standard normal values. And I can be a little more precise instead of 1.65, I'm actually at 1.645. Is that clear? So there's different ways of doing this. It kind of just depends on which way it kind of lines up best with your thinking or maybe makes the most sense to you. Any questions on that before we keep moving? All right, so uh we've got a little bit more hypothesis testing and then we'll probably do a little bit of uh linear regression stuff today so we kind of have a, a look there at two different types of examples so one of them we didn't work through um it'd be very similar kind of the test statistic we did for the first problem when looking at the difference in sample means but if i knew the population variances all the test statistics and the comments will look very similar the only difference is We'd be I erased it. We'd be using this uh, standard normal instead. Okay. So that's one that we won't work through today, but I could maybe ask you a question about. It's really a combination of we we'll use the standard normal just like we did for these sample portion examples, but the test statistic and the confidence interval, I'll show you in the formula sheet, looks very similar to what we were doing for when we had sample means, but only sample variances, right? So we worked through a problem where we had confidence intervals, test statistic with sample variances. Looks very similar up here for the difference in sample means, but when we know the population variance, once you plug the numbers in, they don't look any different. You're just using a different distribution, the Z instead of the T distribution. And I use the notation. You'll notice like in there, I wrote S squared one. And that I'm telling you that's a sample variance. I've used sigma squared one as kind of letting you know this is the, the known population variance. So you just kind of match up at the very worst case, right? Match up to kind of the equations, match up notation there. So this next one we have is gonna look like a matched pairs example. So we're told that what? We've got unemployment rates across counties oh, between two different time periods. So 2008, 2010, we wanna know whether or not the average difference in unemployment rate after the federal, federal increase, right? I think this was an increase in the minimum wage is how I had this set up. We wanna know whether or not the average change across these counties was negative. Right? Was that increase negative? So really, what I'm wanting to test for is, is this kind of true difference, right? I'm only looking at kind of the average, the sample difference, but is the true difference between 2008, 2010, uh, what do I have here? Do, is it greater than zero, right? Oh, wait, no, sorry. It's a, not has it increased. Is it negative, right? Has it decreased, right? Did the minimum wage actually kind of decrease on the point. Yeah. Um, so we have what type of tail test here? The left tail. So I'm going to change this one a little bit because um, we've already done a left tail test, right? So I want to try to show you a little bit of everything. 
So let's instead, right, for a second, so we won't quite match up with these, but if you want to go look at the answer key, you can work through this as a left tail test. I'm going to do it as a two tail test so we get a little practice looking at that. So if I want to treat this like a two tail test, it doesn't matter when I calculate my test statistic. It doesn't matter what type of tail test I have, I calculate my test statistic the same way. So if I go look at the formula sheet here, here's my match pairs examples. The test statistic is simply going to be take that average difference that I found, divide by the variance I found in that difference over my sample size, right? We said it kind of goes back to looking at a one population example because it's the same counties, just we're creating this difference variable between two different time periods. So we found an average difference of 3.2, right? Then we then found, or no, no, sorry, that's the variance. The variance was 3.2. The change was negative 1.2%. And then we had how many counties? 81. Right. So we got everything plugged in. It's going to matter to enter into our calculator. Um, right away, we can see though the denominator is always a standard deviation of the test statistic. This is always positive. So the kind of sample difference I found here, that's going to tell me the sign of my test statistic since that was negative. I know that I can rule out B, right? It has to be one of these other three values. Questions? Yeah. Um, so when you're looking for the formula to use mm -hmm. as a test statistic, you'll either say like P or Z equals for mean. Yeah, so like this one, right? So if I was working through this one, I would have no idea what to use, right? I mean, I, I, maybe I haven't even taken a stats class. Well, if I'm giving you this notation of the average difference D bar, if I'm simply just trying to match up to the equation, I'm well, I know it's going to be one of these, even if I don't know anything about stats, right? Hopefully we're kind of familiar now with the setup of these confidence interval equations, right? Where we're adding and subtracting that margin of error. So then here, it's just going to be, here's my test statistic. Now, the reason why for here, I see a T, a T, but then up here, I've got Z's is because it's also letting me know, yeah, it's a test statistic, but if I've got proportions or known population variances, that's representing something from the standard normal distribution. If I've only got sample variances or I'm looking at a matched pairs example, well, that's coming from the student T. Does that answer your, yeah. was that what you're getting at? Yeah. So I thought, okay. Okay. I'm guessing, I think that test statistic is probably the one that was like negative six something. I'm just looking at the numbers. I can double check me or let me know if that's not right. But um, so we have this negative test statistic, I think here cascading errors, I tell you, instead, assume that the test statistic is negative 1.5. So we said that we're going to change this one a little bit to where we've got a two-tailed test. So what this would be, instead of wanting to know whether or not unemployment has increased or decreased, we just want to know, has unemployment changed after this federal minimum wage increase? We don't know which direction it's going to go. We just want to know, did it change? Is it Was there any change over this time period? So we're going to say, is that difference anything other than zero? That's what we want to test for. We'll assume the opposite is true. So let's assume that I found this test statistic instead, not quite as large as the real one, but negative 1.5. Okay. If I want to find the critical values here, I'm not going to put them on this graph yet because I'm not sure exactly where they are at until I, I look them up. But if I've got a two-tailed test, I'm actually going to have a pair of critical values such that now alpha is not just in one tail, it's in two tails, which means two tail tests kind of start to look like confidence intervals where I've got half of alpha on each side. So here, what's my confidence level? Looks like alpha of 0.05. Right. Maybe I'll do a different one here since we've already done point. Let's do 0 0.01. Uh, so let's do alpha 0 0.01. If you want to work through one point zero five, you've got the answer key. Let's as, instead assume that we're going to use an alpha 0 0.01. So that means half of alpha is on each side. So 0 0.01 over 2 is 0 0.005. Okay. Now, what's my degrees of freedom going to be? So once I have these matched pairs, it goes back to like a one population example. And my formula sheet even reminds me, it's no longer this crazy equation where I'm going to have to tell you this assumed true degrees. Oh, I don't have to tell you, but I am going to tell you what that assumed true degrees of freedom is. But when it comes to a matched pairs, it just goes back to the sample size minus one. 
So if my sample size here was 81, my degrees of freedom is simply going to be 80. I then go, what's the area I want in each tail? 0 0.005. So right here. So my critical values would be negative 2.639 and positive 2.639. The way that we would typically write this, or I would display this on the exam, is that here's the critical values. Okay. In fact, I wonder if should maybe have an example. Uh, let's see. Maybe not. All right. So these ones, I, I guess I didn't give a positive negative because we didn't have any two-tailed tests. But we have a two-tailed test. I'll kind of typically write the critical values as kind of positive, negative, whatever this value is. So what would my rejection decision be here? Well, what I'm going to do is plot my critical values. Now for a two-tailed test, my rejection region is the area kind of going in either tail. My test statistics are not quite in that rejection region. So here, I would fail to reject the null. The only other thing I could maybe do on one like this, and let me look at a value here. I'll give you another, just trying to think of problems that aren't on here that since you're here, since you showed up would, would maybe help. So let's do, Okay, so let's assume that instead of the test statistic of negative 1.5, let's say I told you that the test statistic was negative 1.99. And I wanted you to find the p-value. So instead of using the critical value approach, and once again, we'll do this for a two-tailed test. Let's assume I, I told you I want you to find the p-value. So. The way we find p-values is we use this test statistic. Now, if it's negative, or for a left tail test or a two tail test where we have a negative test statistic, we can find the area in this tail. But remember, it would have been equally as likely we saw something on this side that would have also went against the norm. So we can look up the area in one of these tails. We then need to multiply it by two, and that would give us our p-value. Just like when we were looking up our critical values for a two-tailed test, we had to divide alpha by two, right? Because we had you know, two tails. Well, now when we find the area in one of our tails, the total p-value is the area in both, so we have to multiply that by two. So if I have negative 1.99, I go to my T table, degrees of freedom of 80, I try to find that statistic, looks like it's right here. Now, once again, I don't have the negative values, but it's symmetric. So if I can find the area to the right of positive 1.99, that's the same as the area to the left of negative 1.99. And it looks like that area is going to be 0 0.025. So I just found the area in each of these tails is 0 0.025. So the area combined would be <coughs> that times two or 0 0.05. Yeah. So for like, Doing these test values when they give you the degree of freedom and you have all the other information, do you really just like take the degree of freedom and then look it up in the chart? And that's so if I gave you the assumed true degrees of freedom, like one earlier, yeah, I'm just looking up at that degrees of freedom. I'm finding the test statistic on that row and then going up to the column to see, okay, what's the area to the right of it? Now on the matched pairs, I won't tell you the degrees of freedom, but it's simply going to be sample size minus one. Okay, so here we had a sample size of 81, which is why we were using that degrees of freedom feed. And I, I showed you before, I'll show you again. It's on that formula sheet in the bottom left corner as well. It kind of reminds you of that. So you just take that and then the assumed true value now, or not the assumed true value, we'll probably have to figure that out. But is that what you do? Is it that? It seems a little too simple. So to find the p value? No, to like solve like right here. Yeah, I guess find the p value. Yeah, so if I tell you the test statistic, right? Yeah. All you do is go to that degrees of freedom of 80, scroll down now, and you try to find that test statistic, right? Now, I'm not going to make you put the p-value in a range. So if I did ask you for the p-value with a student distribution, it'll be one of the values in this table. Sure enough, 1.99. So what's the area to the right of positive 1.99? 0.025. It's as simple as that. If this was a left or a right tail test, we'd be done, right? It's not, it's a two-tailed test, so we had one more step 
which is then we have to multiply the area of one of those tails, 0 0.025, by two. And that gives us our total p value of 0 0.05. Now, the reason why this could be important, if we have a two tail test, it can change your rejection decision. Notice, technically here, let's say I wanted to test this at the 5% level. Well, if I forgot to multiply alpha by two, my p value looks like it's less than alpha. My actual p value is the exact same as alpha. So it's not quite less than, right? So it actually flipped my rejection decision there. If I treated this like a two-tail test instead of a, or a one-tail test instead of a two-tail test, I got it should have So that's kind of the old stuff. Um, We'll do a little bit. Uh, I think we worked through some stuff last class. We'll try to look at a few more linear regression examples just to kind of give an idea about what you can expect there. So there we go. Actually, um, did we? Let me see if I want to do these or not. So these are short answer, but I think that they'll be good. You can kind of imagine, I don't know, it doesn't matter if I had a multiple choice, you'd solve them the same way. So I don't think we've looked at this one yet, but I want to try to give you some, some different variables and kind of get some different interpretations. So let's say that I gave you this Excel output, right? And I asked you to interpret the police force expenditure coefficient. Right? So the way that we always interpret these coefficients is a one unit change in our x variable causes our predicted y variable to change by go up or down by whatever that slope coefficient is. Okay? So here, if it helps, I can write out this equation. So it tells me that my dependent variable is property crime rates. And then the two variables I've included here, I've got my intercept, I've got police force expenditures, and I've got my unemployment rate. So how would I interpret this coefficient on police force expenditures? What would a one dollar or one unit increase be? Spending one additional dollar on my police force would change the expected crime rates by whatever that coefficient is. So that coefficient is 12.6. Right? So I think here, I actually didn't have this measured in dollars. I had this measured in like dollars per person or something, but I, I would kind of keep this as a very basic unit for us. So we think about for every dollar, additional dollar I spent in my police force, it looks like crime rates are going up by 12.6 per 100,000 people, right? So crime rates are measured per 100,000 people. So that's a pretty small number, right? 12, pay, pay 12 divided by 100,000, right? So how would I then interpret my unemployment rate coefficient? So that's not a question up here. But what would a one unit change in my unemployment rate be? Unemployment rate is usually measured as percentages, right? So each unit is 1%. That's kind of given to us the paragraph at the beginning. So how would I interpret that unemployment rate variable? Well? So if my X variable goes up by one unit, so if there's a 1%, increase in the unemployment rate, right? That's how it's measured, that's its units. Then the predicted change in my Y variable, or the predicted change in crime rates would be if they go up by 6.96 crimes. So that, that like stands to be one unit, but you like that. These coefficients always reflect the impact on my Y variable of a one unit change in these X variables. Mm -hmm. yep. And the only place where it's a little bit tricky, and we did look at examples like this, and I'll think of something here. Let's say um, I then had this, like, I think this was county level data. I might have said if it's not, it's county level. You can think about it state level, but we'll think about it as counties because we'll say, what if we had an indicator for one if they're in a metro area and zero if they're not? So kind of trying to capture them like an urban versus rural area, right? So how would I interpret B3 here, that coefficient, if I had it on Metro? And let's say it's, I don't know, just to give a number, let's say it's 15, it's 15 right? What would a one unit change in a zero one variable B? We said, 
So if we think about before, one unit changes in here was one more dollar spent in my police force, 1% increase in unemployment rates. Here, it's just measured as a zero one. So the one unit change is going from the zero to the one group. This is like we said, being a non-student athlete, or sorry, being a student athlete relative to a non-student athlete, when we were looking at the effect of being a student athlete on GPAs, that's how we interpreted that, right? Being in the one group relative to the zero group, or moving from the zero group to the one group. So here, if a county was in a metro area relative, right, to that base group, that zero group of not being in a metro area, we predict the crime rate would be about 15 crimes higher. So those zero one variables are a little bit different because the unit change is going from kind of comparing the zero group to the one group. Okay. Is that is it clear on there? Any questions on that? How would I interpret the intercept here? Not with the metro one, but just, just with these two. So we said the interpretation of the intercept, it can get a little bit weird. It's just the baseline, isn't it? Yeah, so the way that we typically say, it's not just the baseline. So I saw some of this on the Excel one where it's like, it's not where it starts out at controlling for other factors or the average of other factors. Our intercept can be thought of as the baseline when these other variables are equal to zero. And we often won't see that in the real world, but it's like, you know, just because all my data is up here, the line still has to <laughs> intercept somewhere, right? And so I would still interpret this as if all my X variables are equal to zero, so zero unemployment rate, spending zero dollars on my police force, then the expected crime rates in the county would be 3,230. So yeah, you can think about it as the baseline, but it's the baseline when all the X variables are equal to zero. In fact, if I included this metro area, the additional interpretation would be a county that has zero dollars spent on their police force, zero unemployment rate, and is not in a metro area, right? Because that'd be the zero value. Their predicted crime rate would be whatever we see for the intercept. Here we have, you know, three thousands. Okay. Questions on that. If I'm looking at these, oh, I think I left them off. I left them off. I didn't mean to do that, actually. I just don't want you to see the test statistics. <laughs> so this should be the easiest question on the exam, right? Hopefully we remember this a little bit. But if I wanted to find a test statistic for any of these coefficients, all I simply do is take that coefficient estimate that I found and I divide it by its standard error. So I might do something like this on the exam where I leave a box over here so you can't see the test statistics. And let's say I ask you for the test statistic on the uh, unemployment rate here. All you would do is take this coefficient of 6.96-ish, divide that by, <laughs> excuse me, my standard error of 116.8, this is going to be, I don't know, really small test stick, but that's all you'd have to do, right? Now, it also spits out at me these p-values. So if I show you these p-values, and this is where you have to be careful, which of these can I say have a significant relationship with crime rates? Which of these variables can I say have a significant relationship with crime rates? Unemployment. So let's look at that one. Those are no e to the negative so this one's e to the negative. This one's 0.95. No e's. Right. 0.95. So which ones have a relationship? Well, remember, what do we always start out assuming with linear regression? That those slopes are equal to zero. Okay. So we start out assuming that there is no relationship. So what we want to try to do is if we can get a p-value less than alpha, we can reject our null rejecting the null says we're rejecting that there's no relationship or we found evidence that there is a relationship so here i'd have to give you a specified alpha i'm kind of going through you know different questions i could ask you so let's say i don't know an alpha of 0 0.01 which of these could i say have a relationship or which of these could i reject the null for? well my police force expenditures 2.2 e to the negative six we said move that means move the decimal six places to the left. So that P value is pretty much zero. So I definitely can reject for that police force 
variable. So I can say that the lease expenditures have a relationship with crime rates. The other p value is 0.95. That is nowhere even close to being less than 0 0.01. I found like very, very weak evidence there. I cannot reject or I fail to reject the null. If I'm failing to reject the null, I'm saying that, <coughs> excuse me, the unemployment rate actually doesn't have a statistically significant relationship with my crime rates. So why do they use double negatives in reference to that? It's it's because mathematics doesn't line up with the way we talk. So right, we start out. You have so you can't assume the null hypothesis can't be that it's not equal to zero because we have to. What we're trying to always find. We're not trying to find evidence. There's no relationship. We're always trying to find evidence. There is some relationship. So we have to assume the opposite is true. So unfortunately, assuming that that value is equal to zero means we're always assuming that there's not a relationship. It's, you know, that's just how we have to say it in English. So it's unfortunate, right? But in rejecting that there's no relationship, uh, we're really saying that there is a relationship. There's, uh, yeah, the short answer is there's no real way around it because mathematics doesn't like line up with the way that we speak or the way that I guess English was right. Maybe there's other languages where it would actually, you know, make it, but there's other ways to say it or make it make sense. Um, it'd be the same thing as like we generally talk in percentages, and really percentages aren't like a thing in mathematics. Like you actually calculate any percentage, you first actually are calculating a proportion. It, but we always use percentages in the way we talk. Um, but yeah, I understand the. I understand the confusion and uh well like why do you use reject and failure to reject rather than just reject or accept them? Why do we use fail to reject? Yeah. So this goes back, I think I kind of mentioned when we were first talking about hypothesis. That the reason why we say fail to reject instead of accept is because we can never truly accept it because we don't have the population data. And the best we can say is that we fail to reject it based off the data we have. We can, have, we can um, it's kind of a logic thing too. If you take like a real analysis class and, and, and go through like these logical proofs, like the way that you're supposed to prove things, you don't ever prove that one and one is equal to two. You actually set up, you try to prove that one plus one can be nothing else. So if I can rule out every other value, then I know it has to be two. It just, it's a weird way of man. Uh, that's the kind of long and short of it, but yeah. I understand that it's annoying, but yeah, we're starting out assuming there's no relationship. We can reject that. We're saying there is. So if I ever ask you which of these have a relationship with the y variable, you're looking for which ones you can reject and all that. It helps just not even worry about this know that because which ones can you reject and all those are the ones that have a significant relationship. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so, got, so I can ask you to calculate these test statistics should be pretty easy. Determine which ones are significant. Um, let me see if I got a better one down here. I don't think I do. So I will use this one. Um, and this is where the answer key that I'll get posted for that, that last Excel will be helpful. Let's say I wanted to make predictions, something else I might ask you to do. So we had this regression equation. We now know the intercept and the slope coefficients. So let's say I wanted um, to know what's the predicted crime rate for a county that has, I don't know, a million dollars spent on their police force and, I don't know, let's say a 5% unemployment rate. Right? Well, I've got these coefficients. All I'm going to do, the whole reason why we're estimating this regression equation is so we can make predictions for our dependent or our y variable. So if I want to predict my crime rates, and I'll show you where there's an equation that kind of reminds you of this on the formula sheet, I'll plug in that value I have for my intercept. All right, that's my value for A, about 3,230. I'll then plug in my coefficient on my police force expenditures. So that's what, 12 point. Six nine or six eight ish, and then I'll plug in that coefficient on my unemployment rate variable, which was six point nine six. 
Now I can plug in different values for the police force expenditures and unemployment or calculate predictions for these hypothetical counties. So there I plug in a million and then plug in 5%, get this under into my calculator, and that would tell me the predicted crime rate for a county that has that unemployment rate and that kind of police force expenditures. You can imagine if I add in like 50 variables here that are really good at explaining crime rates, I can then for any county plug in their values and tell them what they can expect their crime rates to be in the following year. Right? You can start to be kind of predictive. Right? And then, okay, well, what if we spent this much more on our police force? Well, then you would predict the crime rates go, well, in this case, up by that much, right? Because we haven't controlled for a lot of other factors. Any questions on that? One more thing I'll kind of mention so that I want you to know. Um, so making predictions like this will be important. Calculating test statistics, determining what variables are significant, interpreting the coefficients, both the intercept and slopes. And the last thing I might reference is using this R squared. So I kind of gave you a, a layman's or a kind of non-technical way to remember the R squared. So the technical definition is it's the proportion of the variation in our Y variable we're explaining with our dependent or our X variable. So it's the percent of the variation in crime rates we're explaining with just these two variables. So with just those two variables, we're explaining about a proportion of 0.37 or 37% of the variation. Another way I see you could think about it is like R squared is kind of what's the ratio of my predictions relative to what the actual Y values are? Like how far am I off? Right? So, um, we would like to see, or kind of what models we would always prefer, are those that have a higher R squared. So if I'm ever kind of comparing two sets of regression output, like I said, hey, let's say I try to predict crime rates with this, and then I have another regression where I try to predict crime rates with, uh, I don't know, completely different variables, average income, uh, average age in the county, something else. Which of these makes more at or kind of better predictions for our Y variable? Which of these kind of um, has a better um, fit for the relationship between crime rates and whatever variables we're in, we would always choose one that has a higher R squared. Questions on So I think you'll see an answer key for that Excel. I had you do two regressions, one where you include more variables. And then I said, okay, how much more of the variation can we explain with these new variables? And we're just looking at like the difference between R squared there. Questions in general about the exam. Okay. So those practice exams should be really good study tools. I would then say, like I said earlier, move on to the answer key for that fifth Excel for some more help with linear regression. Because that Excel assignment was Excel, but it was also a lot of like you really just use Excel to get the output, right? So that's going to be a good answer key to take a look at. And then after that, I would start going back through the notes, looking at the lecture slide. Do you have a question? Like me working through? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have time to get any up um, uh, before Wednesday. Huh? I don't know if you had any, like, you already did a week. No. Um, yeah. I uh, I'll, I will hunt for some old videos, and if I can find them, I'll get those up there. Uh, it might be slightly different questions in this practice exam, but I, I will. I'll try to look. I'll post the the audio from today, um, but or well, the page or you know, did a lot of them before. But I, I will try to look for some old videos and get those on there too. Is there only one detailed answer? Is there not one for A? Or... Yeah, I think I only had. Let me see. Uh, well, I thought maybe there was sick here. So B detailed answers, if I remember right. Yeah, so I didn't have kind of the these written out for here, although we worked through. Okay, yeah. yeah. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And if you can't kind of reproduce those, I can try to kind of send you something pretty quick, scratch something down, send you a send you a scanned version of it or something. Okay. I'm just going to focus on the practice <laughs> heavily. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. Have a good one. You too.